Hi, I'm Ted Haftegaber, founder and producer of Live Talks Los Angeles. Thanks for joining us. Since we started over a decade ago, we have brought you hundreds of conversations with storytellers, writers, actors, musicians, humorists, chefs, and thought leaders in business and science. You can watch and hear most of these in our YouTube channel and our podcast. For details, visit LiveTalksLA.org. And now, Here's the show you've tuned in to see. First of all, like, I'm going to interview somebody who is a journalist, mm -hmm. but not just any journalist, Kara freaking Swisher for crying out That's loud. That's my name. That's yes. And um, so I thought, how do you kind of go into this if you're an amateur at it? Mm -hmm. And beautiful, the beauty of this book is you gave the answer in the book. Oh, okay. So what is it? I'm, I'm going to quote you a little bit here. He said, okay. first, uh, first, make it a conversation. Yeah. We're going to try to do that. That's easy for us. Yep. Uh, second, do not be afraid to ask the question everyone is thinking. Yeah, good. Third, uh, conduct the discussion as if you were never going to interview this oh. person again. Yikes. Okay. <laughs> Yikes for you, really, not me. Uh, okay. right, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep your advice in mind and really okay. be in the back of my head the whole time. Okay, good. But I want to talk about this first. The book, the title, uh, Burn Book, it's obviously a nod to Mean Girls. Right. So I thought this was going to be like uh, a trashing of a bunch of people. It, a little bit. It's a little bit. But it also sounded a lot like a Taylor Swift breakup song. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So when you think about your relationship with these folks who mm -hmm. you built on over the years, uh, what, what would be one thing? If you could have one do-over. Do-over. With oh. any of them and one of and only one. You only get one. Oh, wow. What would you do? Well, <laughs> if you go back in time travel, yeah. I, I guess probably go back and get Mark Zuckerberg interested in something other than tech. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Or, you know, go back um, with Elon many years ago and say, maybe don't do that, like late at night at 3 a.m. Um, but I think probably, if I had to go back, I mean, it's, it's called a tech love story, right? That's yeah. the second part, because I yeah. wanted to make clear that I don't hate tech, and I don't think you think I do. No. Um, I think in a lot of ways, I, I joke about it, I don't like some people have done to the place, right? In mm -hmm. terms of, this is a, tech can be a real gift to humanity, and one of the, the things I discussed was, if you were at Kitty Hawk and, and you were watching it, you wouldn't start insulting how it did that day. It wasn't very long, it didn't, yeah. it didn't fly very long, it didn't fly very high. You wouldn't say, ugh, it was a mess. You'd say they flew. Like, you have to see what's great about it. Yeah. Um, what I think is at the heart of the book is the idea that really irritated me from the beginning, I think, and not with companies like Netflix, because it was very clear what you were doing. You were selling something, right? It wasn't, yeah. you didn't, I don't think I ever heard from Reed Hastings, we're here to bring humanity together. No, right? You know, we're, here's a CD, watch it. I we, think that was pretty much we, 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 we did. We did use the word connect too much, though, too. We did, did that, you? too. Did yeah. you? Yeah. 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 <laughs> anyway. It's a very um, attractive word. Yes, it is, but it was like yeah. movie watching. Yeah. Got it, okay. Instead of going, you know, instead of going to my video store, I went to Netflix, right? right? Blockbuster to Netflix, yeah. essentially. But a lot of these people tried to pretend that they were doing something other than money making. And yeah. I don't mind money making. I'm like, fine. I'm, and so that's why the first line of the book is, so it was capitalism after yeah. all. And it was. Yeah. And one of the things they, if they had done that, I think I would have rather heard that from them versus a lot of the nonsense. Um, and that they, they took what was a public thing, which was the internet, which was built by the US government. They took advantage of it, did not have any guardrails, got to do whatever they want because of the, the, the this doesn't apply to Netflix again, um, but it, having this section 230 to protect them from yeah. being sued, and then didn't have the respect to worry about safety, worry about um, implications, worry about propaganda, and I, I'm using the word propaganda rather than misinformation, because that's what it is. Yeah. That's all that it is. Yeah. I think that's the only word you can have for it. And I just, that, that, the lack of accountability and the lack of um, 
care for safety really started to really get on my nerves. The nonsense was fine. The slides and the, the, the need to act like children was just kind of weird and performative. Yeah. Um, but it just was a, it was a disappointment. Yeah, I, the first time I went up to Silicon Valley to Netflix to the mm -hmm. headquarters and I met, uh, for the very first time, 1999, mm -hmm. and it wasn't uh, exactly, the, they didn't have a slide. They did not. Uh, but there, no, there was no slides. But it was kind of like, it was interesting, there were mountains and mountains of boxes. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that they were like from places I never heard of, like drugstore.com and right. razorblade.com. And everyone, right. everyone was buying everything or the, at the whatever it was dot com. And mm -hmm. they were really living their life very differently than I was yeah. you know, in LA. Mm -hmm. and, and this notion, I don't, I don't know where the, the where, why offices had to be like playgrounds, but that well, was pretty Netflix's prevalent. Well, Netflix's wasn't. Netflix's was no, not. No, we never did that. We never no, did, yeah. it was interesting because there was a dichotomy between like the apples of the world and Microsoft, yeah. w which were unfun. Right, yeah. unfun. Um, and, you know, they had chairs, like crazy. <laughs> and and then you would go, it, you know, and then you would go to. I mean, Google was the absolute worst. It was crazy. Yeah. Um, but excited home when I it was excited at the time. It was a not Google, which everyone, there was a lot of not Googles essentially. And yeah. and they had a slide, and they literally was like, use the slide. And we, they had a fake garage door, and I was like, I don't want to go on your fucking slide. I'm not. I'm. I'm I was 36 years old. I'm like, I'm not. <laughs> I, 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 you didn't like slides when you were a kid. I didn't like slides when I was a kid. I hated slides. I was like, not again. And it's not happening when I'm this old. And, and they had like the performative garage door, which yeah. was kind of sad to me. I was like, what are you doing? And th the thing about Google, years before, um, I, I was there very early when Google started, uh, in the, when they were in the garage, Susan Wojcicki's garage. And they were, they were silly, odd people. They were definitely odd people. There was no question about it, the two of them. Um, but one of the things they had at one point when they put all those multicolored bicycles all over the Google campus when they moved yeah, to Mountain View, um, and they had lots of them everywhere, and you could ride them between buildings. And Sergey started going on and on about he was going to drop thousands of these bicycles in every single city. And he had figured out how many it would take, how many would be stolen, how many would be, like he was going to drop hundreds of thousands of bicycles on major cities yeah. without permission. Right? <laughs> and, and he went on and on how he was going to do this and how he was going to solve the entire car crisis doing this. And I was sort of like, all right, sure. And he goes, what do you think of our bicycles? And I said, I have two feelings about your bicycles. Because they were sitting there, like, yeah. you know, outside of Google. I said, one, I'm thinking of stealing one. Because they're kind of cool looking, right? They're multicolored bicycles. It's, in the fa it's already factored in. Why not? Yeah. Since you, like, why not? I said, and secondly, I want to drive my car through them right now because I just, <laughs> you people annoy me so much. And I felt like such a crab, but it was, the, the, the performative nature of so many of these people was, I didn't know where it came from. It, it, was, it was sort of arrested yeah. development of, yeah. of their childhood or something. And it was, it got in the way of what they were doing, which was a much more killer instinct rapacious information thieves, as Walt Mossberg called them. Yeah. You know, yeah. that's what they were. Well, when you, um, I think of you as pretty, pretty tough, and you're mm -hmm. pretty cynical. And mm -hmm. are you, Thank when you. you think back, I mean, in a good way, in a good way, in a I'm positive good. way. I'm good, I'm good. But I think, so why do you think, in retrospect, mm -hmm. that you believe that these folks were going to be anything other than capitalists? At, well, at, ultimately? I, I believe that the technology was groundbreaking. When I yeah. first, um, you know, I, I, I have concerns like everyone else about where our world's going, not just from a climate change point of view, but like how do you get as much information out to people as possible? How yeah. do you keep democracy going? And one of the, the, the things in the book was the Star Trek, Star Wars dichotomy that yeah. I sketched out, which was Star Wars is, is, and I've interviewed George Lucas about this, but it's a Holocaust metaphor. There is that about it. And yeah. He's talked about that. Um, and one of the things about it is evil prevails quite a lot in that quite movie. Lot, yeah. All the time, actually. And it's not necessarily a hero movie because all the heroes are flawed. There's, you know, it's very con confusing and it's a dark tale. Um, and in Star Trek, it's like I, I say, it's a United Benetton commercial where everyone gets <laughs> along and it's so diverse and every and the villains become good and they yeah. shift them and oh, I didn't realize I shouldn't have tried to kill people. Um, <laughs> and everything works and it's the idea is learning, you know, bold places you go where you haven't been before. And that's my version of it. And oddly enough, I had forgotten that Steve Jobs had said the same thing to me in an interview where he's like, I want Star Trek. We don't have Star Trek. Yeah. Um, and I kind of had that idea of Star Trek, and maybe because I grew up with Star Trek, or you have this idea that you could use technology for good, and you s still can, like you absolutely still can. 
what happened was that it shifted rather dramatically to privacy violations, selling you stuff, um, selling your data for, yeah. for their advantage for when you get nothing back, right? That was the thing, is that you got, you got a dating service, you got a map, by the way, guess who paid for all the maps? The US government, yeah, yeah. right? They just took our maps that we paid <laughs> for and then did more with them. And so I, that, was, that was disappointing, because I do think technology has the capacity to do amazing so, things. So you, you were excited about what they were doing and, and, and assumed that they would have, everyone would be doing good with it. Why not? Well, Why I, thought, I assumed that it would be yeah. equal. I didn't yeah. think that they weren't going to make money from it. I'm not naive. Yeah. I just thought the, the, the quote in the book that's critical, and I think this is the center of the book, is the Paul Virilio quote about when you invent the ship, you invent the shipwreck. Ship, yeah. When you invent the plane, you invent the plane crash. What I got worried about was after all this time, now so many ships, if you live in the Northeast especially, so many ships wrecks everywhere across yeah. there. But the minute they put the lighthouse in, Great, everything works. We don't want shipwrecks, um, and and you don't want plane crashes. Um, but we have not put in lighthouses after right. all this time, and they're the richest people on earth. They're, they're literally the richest people, the most. They benefited the most, and we say thank you for what we've done for them. Like I, you know, I just yeah. feel like it's just not a good trade, particularly good trade. Well, I'm going to get back to those guys in a bit. I, I do want to talk uh, uh, about what's in, about the book itself a little bit because it's really, uh, first of all, it's, it's beautifully done, which Thank is a, a bit of a uh, biography intertwined yeah, with Yeah, I didn't 30 want to put the personal stuff in. But yeah, I was, I'm going to get to that because it's, it's really intertwined with 30 years of tech history mm -hmm. and a little bit of personal stuff, a little bit. You yeah. give us a little bit. And, um, and in the, early in the book, you talk about um, tragically losing your father early. Mm -hmm. Uh, your dad certainly had a big influence on you, it seemed to, in the little bit mm -hmm. we covered in the book. And w in what ways did he? Did well, he I think when someone, you? you know, interestingly, I just interviewed Reed Jobs today, who is Steve Jobs' son, who looks alarmingly like him and yeah. has his facial. I was, it was hard to talk to him. We did it remotely, but um, he's working on cancer research, which I think is really laudable. Yeah. Uh, obviously, he's been motivated by the death of his father yeah. uh, with pancreatic cancer. Um, I think when your parent dies at a young age, you realize you recognize time is 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 so precious, like very. Pre you really, my dad was got out of the navy, got his first job, bought his first house, and he keeled over from an aneurysm, just dead. With three kids, like he was starting his life, and so I think when that happens, one, it sort of upends your entire life, and then it says you don't have time. Yeah. Nobody has time. It could happen. Urgency. Yes, yeah. you have urgency. And so you don't tend to waste time. Um, and I was like that from very early. I mean, I tell a story in the book where I was in you know, third grade and I walked out of class. I'm like, I've read this now. Let's move on. <laughs> and, come on, next. let's go next. And so I, I'm often like that. Like yeah. I don't have a lot of patience for wasted time. And I, I do that. I think the part that I do like that I put in this book was that my career was like that which was actually helped by entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs are like that, you know that. It's yeah. like, I mean, look at Netflix's history of like, they went from CDs, that decision was a huge one to get off of CDs and yeah. go to digital. What a, wow, that could have gone sideways. It was a hard turn. Yeah, it was yeah, a hard turn. Was yeah. a hard turn. Yeah. So it's really hard for, I mean, I think one thing I, I love about tech is the hard turns. They do yeah. like go, we need to go this way. And I think I was already like that. And so one of the reasons I love tech was because of that. Not everybody loves it because the hard turns can be, you know, you just went through the Hollywood strike stuff. It's very hard yeah, what's right. happening. Yeah. The, the, um, you only put a couple of even photos of your family in your early mm -hmm. days in the picture. Um, uh, you don't mention your mom too much. No. She's still with us. She's yes, with us. she yeah. is. Oh, yes. And <laughs> Someone's laughing. <laughs> <laughs> he knows her. Yes, she's still with us. Yeah. <laughs> Any reason we don't give her a lot of ink in the book yet? Or? She's the next book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, my brother and I are writing it. It will contain. It will contain. It will contain multitudes. Let's just say um, she's a she's a difficult person. Let's so, just. But you're still you're still too young for a. She's a blunt. Fox News. But if you read the New York Times, you can read some of my columns. Yeah, about it. she comes. She up. told me she flu, the code was the flu. That was nice. And <laughs> one time, th this is a good example of, of of propaganda. And this in this case, she's a Fox News watcher. Uh, over the years, she hated Trump and now loves him. No, then hated him again, then loves him again. Yeah. But uh, whatever Fox is doing, she does. And at one point, I interviewed Hillary Clinton, um, and I've interviewed her a number of times. And my mom called me. She goes, "That Hillary Clinton." I've told the story. She's that Hillary Clinton. She said this. Uh, people like me. And I'm, first of all, I'm like, 
elite rich people like you, but okay, sure. Um, and she, she had her mind. Yeah, she had right? Her mind. She's, a, she's a woman of the people, my mother, and she lives in the, <laughs> in the Upper East Side of New York. Um, so uh, so she, goes, uh, she goes, she said this about people like me, and then she repeated it, and I was like, that's familiar. And I said, oh my God, they took my my interview with her and mushed it in some ugly way on yeah. social media and on Fox and vomited it back up incorrectly, right? And yeah. so she had pieces of it, but it looked like someone vomited, like yeah. on the sidewalk. <laughs> and I said, no, no, that, mom, <clears throat> that was my interview. That's not what she said. And my mom goes, oh, you're wrong. It's what she said. It's what you said. Yeah. And yeah. I was like, I'm your daughter. I did the interview. It's yeah. not what she said. And so... I made her go listen to it. I go, can you just go listen to it? And yeah. she listened to it. She called me back and she goes, all right, it's not what she said, but let's talk about her emails. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, she's a housewife in Chappaqua. That's what she is now. That's what Hillary Clinton is. You know, she has no power yeah. of any sort, but she's still obsessed with it. But those emails are still But those there. emails. <laughs> yeah. She's running the country in case you're, no, Kamala Harris is running the country. No, wait. So, Wait, he's a genius. No, he's not a genius. It's just like... <laughs> so you, you say, um, and you've said in the past, and there's many examples in the book, of the best way to live your life is to plow through, say what's on your mind, yes. deal with the consequences. What do you think of that? Did you, have you liked that? About oh, me? absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's not easy. It's yeah. not easy to do. And I think a lot of... Com and again, this kind of goes back to the this tech ideas of things like radical candor and those kind of yeah. things. And there, there's real radical candor and there's yeah. the things like, you know. Which you can't do, really. I one not, time saw yeah. him <laughs> in the polo lounge. I was there meeting the Tinder guy. Yeah. I don't know if you saw me. But you were with, I think it was Jeff, uh, what's it, uh, Katzenberg. Yeah. And I saw you trying to convince, you must have been trying to convince him to put stuff on Netflix or something. I'm sure I was. Uh, yeah, you were like, and you were so on. charming. I could hear it. It was really <laughs> funny. I was laughing and I thought, oh man, I would never be able to do his job. But, <laughs> but what you're doing right now and what you did in the book is, I mean, I think a lot of people watch it, in a, say, with envy mm -hmm. because people do walk around not able to or feel like they're not yes. able to say what's on their mind as yes. clearly and directly as you do. Yeah, it's down to me and Elon Musk, right? <laughs> <laughs> but these things come with the cost, right? So what, what does it cost you over the years? You know, with really smart people, not nothing, not a thing. Like, I've interviewed Steve Jobs eight to ten times. Like, we had lots of beefs, yeah. you know, uh, or Tim Cook or uh, lots of people. Mark Cuban and I used yeah. to beef all the time about lots of things. I could, there's a list of a dozen people right. like that. Um, I really believe smart people do not mind having smart debates, and they like it, yeah. right? Because, you know, talking points gets ex get exhausting, right? 100%. Um, and so I think they really like that. The other thing is um, it's really hard when you're in a position of authority, like if you're you or Bob Iger or Tim Cook, you have everybody telling you everything, and you don't know everything, right? I do talk to everybody, and yeah. so I have insights that maybe you don't know or might say something. And so most adults welcome that, I've noticed. I, 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 I sort of mix the adults with the adult toddlers, essentially. <laughs> and, and, and those who don't like it, I don't know what to say. They don't, if they want to be surrounded by people who they pay all day and be told yeah. they're really smart, that will make them less good at what they do, and they make bad decisions. Yeah, and it's strange that they get through the, the web, because it, it should, you shouldn't go too far if you have that dynamic in your Well, a lot of people yeah. do, yeah. I think. It's really interesting. And so I, I think they're vaguely attracted to someone. Like I said, you're either an asset as a truth teller, and it's just my opinion. It's not like you don't yeah. have to listen to me, or, um, or you're a truth teller and you're, you're an enemy. And I think that's what's interesting. And another thing that helps is being right a lot of the time, being yeah. calling it right, right? I know, I'm sorry, but I have been. You've I'm, done it. You've done I it have. Well, yeah. there, was one, there was one incident I write about in the book where... Um, and just because I, I wanted to be in the CIA, I wanted to be an analyst. Yeah. I, that's I would have been Homeland, by the way, except with 100 <laughs> percent less. We'd be making less, a show about you on Netflix right now. 100 percent less yeah. uh, sexual activity, straight sexual activity, <laughs> and mental illness. Right? She was like a hot fucking mess. I'm less not sex and waterboarding. No, anymore, no, uh, no, yeah. not for me. Um, but I wanted to do that. I was really good at that. I was good at puzzles yeah. in school. And one of the reasons I'm a good reporter is because I can imagine where it's going. I can get. I, I'm yeah. a good guesser. And so one of the things I did in the New York Times when I had the column, in, I wrote a column in 2019, which is in the book, where I, 
I was saying Trump is getting very dangerous on Twitter. A lot of his stuff was violent, and, and he yeah. keeps breaking their rules. What did, why do they have rules? I kept, that was one of my things, whether it was Facebook. I'm like, they keep breaking your rules, and you keep them on. Why do you have rules or kick them off or something? Yeah. You know? and, uh, and so I, I put a scenario together where I said, Trump loses the election. Here's how I think it's going to go. He's going to say it's a lie. He's going to repeat it. It's going to go up and down the right-wing food chain, which is very vast. It goes way to the bottom and up to the fox. Essentially, that's right. how it works. <laughs> um, and, I, and it's really strong. It's a strong network. Um, and he's going to keep repeating it over and over again, that the election was stolen. The election was stolen. And then he's going to ask them in some fashion. He's going to radicalize them and ask his followers to take action in the real world. I wrote this. Yeah. Now, that's a pretty good guess, right? Pretty good what guess, happened? Yeah. I know. And when I wrote it at the time, and I said Twitter, and, and someone asked me when I put this scenario out in this column, what would I have done? And I said I never would have let it get this bad to begin. I would have thrown him off. He just kept breaking rules. I don't care who he is. He broke rules. Right. He's saying violent things. He's talking about war. He's talking about civil war. Um, and it's against their rules. And, and of course, I see why they might not want to have kicked him off, but you might have started to do things. and. Twitter's, uh, it was either Dorsey, or, they called me, they're like, this is very irresponsible to say, Kara. And I was like, okay, but it's gonna happen. Like, it's gonna happen. Yeah. Like, I don't think it's irresponsible to predict what happens with these, with this, with propaganda. You've seen it happen from ever, from ever to forever. Like, Nazism, everything, it right. happens. And I think that's one of the things that is really part of the heart of the book is lack of accountability and lack of care when I call Mark carelessly, I like Mark personally. He's actually a, a, a he looks very good in Indian clothes, by the way. He's in a, he's at, I saw he's at a mega one. Yeah. You weren't yeah. invited? You no, weren't I was invited? not invited. Really? Yeah. Interesting. I, I know. Would you have gone? I don't know what I did the last time. Let me ask you a question. This is just me. Yeah. Would you have gone if you were invited? To I kind of would have. Would yeah, oh, yeah, for sure. Oh, yeah, yeah, right? Like yeah. Rihanna. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I would have had my own tent. With, I know, right? Uh, yeah. 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 That's what I thought. I would have done the same thing. I, at yeah. one point, I was like, really, Gates? Can't you just get that? Can't you hire Rihanna for the evening? So, um, I'm back, what am I talking about? Oh, anyway, lack of accountability. I think that's the whole thing was, you know, when I said that. It I didn't was, get invited to the Trump dinner either, by oh, the way. Oh, well, yeah. yeah, you didn't. I mean, <laughs> I'm gonna, when I read that first page, I go, oh, I'm glad I didn't get invited to the I dinner. I know, I know. They could, <laughs> they could only have one liberal there, and yeah. that was Cheryl, um, who went willingly. Uh, uh, you know, I think it's just the lack of accountability, a lack of foresight of everything, whether it was Facebook Live. That was another back and forth I had with them. I went there. They showed it to me. They kept talking about Chewbacca mom, you know, ooh, fun, cat videos. And I was like, <laughs> okay, but what if someone kills himself on here? What if someone murders someone? What if someone straps it on their head like a GoPro and starts doing a massacre? Like, yeah. This I, is how I, where I came up with cynical, by the way. Right, that's not cynical, <laughs> but I was like, well, this is what the person yeah. said to me. And yeah. I said, and they're like, you're a bummer. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, yeah, I'm a fucking yeah. bummer. But yeah. guess what? People are going to use these things for, like, I'm sorry. Is there any tool that's never been used by bad people? And this one is a great tool yeah. for bad people. Yeah. Back to your parents for a second. Yeah. Is that, like, willingness to, I know you don't like to talk truth to power mm -hmm. line, but yeah, the, your willingness or your ability to do that, was that at home? Was that a home practice? Um, I think you have to in an Italian family. You yeah. have to, like, push yeah. back like a super... No, I was like that. I don't know. I just genetically like that. I just, I just oh, always was like, huh? The huh? Was, huh? I'm like, I was Larry David <laughs> before God. Larry yeah. David. What? So the. I was always like, what? <laughs> what did you just say to me? And uh, you know what it's from? It's from being gay. I, I honestly is yeah. because one of the things was I knew I was gay from very early on, and I sought out books, and I was like, oh, okay, this is what it is. This is a very unattractive viewpoint of gay people. Like this is, I don't believe yeah. this. And I used to read a lot of stuff that I didn't agree with. And I, I was like, that's not me. That's not how I feel. And there's a great movie called The Celluloid. The way you were presented. Yes, you were presented, presented yeah, it in the yeah. media. And it was important. And there's a book um, called The Celluloid Closet. And there's also a movie. And it's depictions of gay people. Yeah. It was narrated by Lily Tomlin. I highly recommend it um, by Vito Russo. Uh, they made this doc of it. And it's better as a doc because you see the yeah. scenes. And when you start to see it collectively, you see why people hated gay people. You just saw it. You saw the propaganda building. I was right. riveted to this movie. And so I was always like, that's not how I am. And it made me furious. And so when people tell me things that aren't true, I'm like, that's not true. Yeah. My, so. my brother told me about the movie years ago. Mm -hmm. he, 
being gay in Phoenix was very tough. I bet. And he, he called me when every once in a while and say, I'd like to come to LA and hang out for the week and be gay. Mm -hmm. Like, what do you mean? <laughs> okay, <laughs> he, right. goes, he goes, we can't, uh, his partner and him could not hold hands walking down the street. No. It was dangerous. Yeah, no, again, and, and, not again, by the way. Yeah, and he told me about the, uh, the, the movie because he said, and which was fascinating to me, like the, the, there were so few gay characters that That's you would actually right. look for other characters that seem kind of gay. Right. And you'd say, to identify with Right, them. and also so, they yeah. were always, film, you know, really. uh, lesbians were always like, trying to get straight ladies. I'm like, that's not the definition of a lesbian. <laughs> <laughs> like, thank you, ladies. No, thank you. I'm not interested. You know? Honestly, it's the opposite. Let's be clear. <laughs> 100%. You know. Um, and then, you know, guys were always either really, like, fey, you know, very prissy. Some are. Some are. It just yeah. depends. And, um, and, uh, and they, or else they were conniving, you know, but it was always very negative and everyone was suicidal in the end. And it's just <laughs> like, and it was just, it really, I have to say, it, it was the first time I was like, I cannot believe these idiots are saying something that isn't true and I'm putting up with this. And I think, I think AIDS was one of the, I'm, I'm, I don't know how old you are, but I'm 62, 61. Right um, uh, and it was very much the AIDS crisis, I think, Really, I wasn't an activist particularly. I was, I definitely did marches and everything else, but I was just like, this is bullshit. Yeah. This is bullshit, we're dying, and they're just doing this out of discrimination. It's really crazy. And your turning point into professional journalism was kind of around the same thing. It was. Mm -hmm. Seeing the Washington Post cover something badly and then calling them on Yes, I stole pictures, yeah. They wanted <laughs> yeah. to print pictures that were wrong about yeah. gay people, and I just hid them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she says with great pride. That's yeah. good. But in your, um, but when you're a student journalist, you were calling out the Washington Post for some I coverage was. they were doing on campus. Yes, you, I was. So again, yeah. I was a dis disagreement does really well as a reporter. <laughs> yeah. um, a they had here. covered yeah. a. Um, they had covered. Uh, I was very interested in El Salvador, and was that was horrible what happened yeah. there. Um, a lot of the murders. And there was a guy um, named Roberto Di, uh, Roberto Del Buzon, whatever. He was Colonel who had killed a lot of people. Yeah. There's a great poem by Carolyn Forche called The Colonel, I believe it's about him. Um, and, and he was coming to Georgetown campus and I was covering it for the student newspaper. I was sort of like the top reporter there, at columnist. And, um, and they covered it and they, it was full of errors. The piece was full of errors. And you were piece. there, you saw the I was first there, time, yeah. And I was annoyed yeah. and I love the Washington Post and I read it every day. And I called up the Washington Post and I go, hi, it's Kara Swisher, um, so it's it good down. to talk to you. Yeah. Um, I'd like to talk to someone about this article, it's really bad. And, <laughs> and they put me on the phone with the Metro editor. I don't know how I got through to him, his name's Larry Kramer. And I started haranguing him about what a sloppy piece of shit this article was. And of course, the, the least person on the totem pole in a newspaper was sent to the college campus to cover, to cover a speech. Story, like yeah. it wasn't their top level talent, yeah. right? But I didn't know that, I didn't know that as a kid. And, um, and he's like, well, you're pretty mouthy for a student. I go, yes, I am. I'm very <laughs> mad about your inaccuracies. And inaccuracies drive me crazy. Like, that, yeah. that just drives me nuts. And so I went down. I took the bus. There's, it's, it's this uh, at 15th and L. And I walked in, and I kept yelling at him. And he's like, I'm going to hire you. You're such a pain in the ass. And that was it. <laughs> so he hired me as a stringer. It was great. It worked fine. I like the cut of your jib. I like the cut of your jib. <laughs> <laughs> No, but he didn't like the cut of my jib, but he liked the cut of my jib, yeah, right? Yeah, moxie. Yeah. My moxie, moxie. Yeah, moxie. Yeah. My moxie. <laughs> and that's what I did a lot of time. You know, I had a story about John McLaughlin, the TV show host, who was started the Screaming Cable I, Fest. I missed thing. that last chapter of his life. I didn't know I you know. got into your book. I didn't know Oh, that. yeah. He was really quite a sexual harasser. That was yeah. pre- me too. For me, pre, it's pre just Dana Carvey to me. Because the, the Dana oh, Carvey yeah. impression, that's all Issue one. Issue yeah. one. Everyone's funny, yeah. but he was a terrible, malevolent yeah. prick. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I way less funny than the yeah, impression. Yeah, way less funny. It wasn't uh, funny as uh, it happened. But he really wrecked this one woman's, like, just, yeah. just because he felt like being a sexual harasser. And so when I testified, that's the best, I think that was my greatest moment. And On the record, you put your, with your name, not anonymously. With my name, or, yeah. what happened was he, he sexually harassed someone we, we went to complain to the chief of staff and she said, we must be lying. It was incredible. I was 23 years old. And so she, uh, we left, we quit. Um, and then he did it to someone else, of course, because these people are serial sexual harassers. Yeah. And, uh, but not a lot was known at the time and it was quite accepted in Washington, everywhere else it was. And he, um, uh, he, we testified against him in the second trial, the woman who did get to trial with him. And then she settled with him, which 
fine, whatever. She settled and did a non-disclosure, which was very typical too. And, um, and so the Washington Post came around at the time, this guy named Eric Alterman, he was doing a feature and, and McLaughlin was very powerful and during the Reagan administration. And he said, would you talk to me about what happened? And I said, absolutely. And he said, well, we can go off the record. I go, absolutely not. I'm not going off the record. If my name isn't next to it, they're not gonna believe it. Like, they ha you have to put your name next to something. Right. And so I described what he did. Only two people went on the record, me and a young man who, he, who witnessed this. And we went on the record about it and talked about it in this profile, saying this guy was, you know, a handsy fuck. Like, that's what he did. And so, I didn't say that particularly, but he was. <laughs> and he, um, and I ran in, I was by that time working for the Washington Post later when I ran into him, and he said, um, he came up, he's a big guy, he's a very big guy, and he came up and he goes, in a town where everybody stabs you in the back, you stab me in the front and I appreciate that. <laughs> he said that to me, he was a very dramatic person. Yeah. And I said, anytime you son of a bitch. And he's like, <laughs> and he looked at me, I looked at him, and that's the last time I saw him, he's dead, I'm glad for it. So. <laughs> His wife. Two things happened. His wife came up to me later, his, his widow, and said she was sorry, which was very nice. Uh, I think she, was, she had divorced him, but she said something nice. But the person who was the chief of staff came up to me years later when I was a very well-established reporter yeah. and said, um, I'm, I'm, I'm so sorry I did that. You know, or, you know I, I, I know it was a different time. It wasn't quite an I'm sorry. It was a Mark Zuckerberg I'm sorry. It wasn't quite an I'm sorry. <laughs> and, and she goes, I, I hope you'll forgive me. I said, no, I, I think I won't. Uh. And she's like, oh, and I go, you thought I'd say I would, but I don't. What you did to two young women was yeah. reprehensible. I hope you feel bad for the rest of your life. So. That's, that's radical candor. That's, <laughs> that's radical candor. We call it something else. Yeah. So I, I'm with you on the, the, the real value of a free press and why yeah. it's so important. Good, so and good. I, I, was a, I don't know if you knew this, but I was a wannabe journalist. I, really? Yeah, I was a high what? school editor of the newspaper. What? And, and, what was it and called? junior college. The, the, the Voice was the, our college paper that I was the editor of. That Where? I did in Glendale Community College in okay. Phoenix, Arizona. Uh -huh. And I, was, I went there, I kind of stumbled into it. I signed up to be in high school to be on the yearbook. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was full, so they dumped me into the newspaper. Okay. And it was called The Scimitar, that newspaper. Scimitar. And, and I walked in the, the, the high school, my high school crush, who I've had for like two years, was in the class where I stayed. <laughs> <laughs> that was my attraction to journalism. But then I really, I really fell in love with it and I really admire, I think that I, I, I see journalists as heroes and continue to be. And, and, I, and I don't know if you know this case or not, but in, when I was young in, in Phoenix, there was a, an investigative reporter named Don Bowles mm -hmm. uh, who was investigating mob influence in oh, Arizona wow. and was blown up in his car. Oh my God. And it was, uh, it, to me, it's like I became very fascinated with the story and what does he do? What's he doing for a living? And why did they want to kill him so badly? And, yeah. And he was about to expose the truth, to mm -hmm. your point. Mm -hmm. And so it just felt like a very virtuous thing. Yeah. And I, I don't know why. I, I didn't go on with it because I discovered my second year at junior college, I was not a very good writer. Oh, okay, yeah. good. good. <laughs> I kind of wish someone would have told me a ah. lot before that. Cause, you know, I wanted yeah. to be an architect, but everything I designed was ugly. So there we so, are. Yeah, but do people tell you? <laughs> I knew it. I did, no one needed to. You knew, you, you knew, yeah. I didn't know. I was actually, I had apply, I was applying for a scholarship for uh, layout and design, mm -hmm. and I was putting my articles together on this little clipbook, and I'm reading them, and I go, ooh, these are not good. Oh, like, wow. <laughs> if I didn't write, write this, I wouldn't keep reading this. Wow. But, yeah, so I just, oh, man. so I went to plan B, I went to business. Oh, good. Well, it worked yeah. out well for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> nice. So, <laughs> What do you think is the risk or uh, possibility of a free press? In, oh, given it's, what's it's under massive attack. Now, yeah. look, I don't think the press can't be make mistakes. And yeah. uh, look, I think that's one of the things we do a little too much is sort of virtue signal, at, like we're the only saviors. Of, I don't think we're the saviors of society. But you know, from the very beginning, this country, the strength has been the ability to speak truth to power in some fashion by whoever, yeah. not just the press. And I do think the, the constant drumbeat of misinformation and, propag and propaganda mm. has really, on all institutions, not just the press. Yeah. Um, I do think probably the press is not as well liked as throughout its history as we think it was. We had this brief, beautiful period of Watergate where you know, yeah. reporter, you know, and the movies did that. There was an extent yeah. of a Made series of movies yeah. um, where everybody was a hero. And I think most, for most of the history, the press was, had a very up and down. Um, you know, whether it was the yellow journalism or something like that, or even you go back to, you know, Washington and Hamilton, they were like all using the press as, 
as weapons, tools, yeah. tools and weapons for each other and just using weird names like Cincinnatus or whatever to write <laughs> these things. But it was, you know, I think one of the things that happens is when you become a post-fact society, um, it's very dangerous of what happens. And one of the problems we've had is that most people, for a while, we were in an information desert, right? A total, I mean, I think most people just didn't read the media, right. right? There just wasn't, and people just didn't engage in it, and they had a very small group of things, whether it was the nightly news, which is just three shows, essentially, or one newspaper. It still was the attitude of one group of yeah. people who owned it, but it, people had not too much information, and what happened, the opposite, is now there's too much information, right? right? It's, it's an information flood, and people get, um, and they believe whatever's written in a lot of ways. And so now with Facebook being the, the, the distributor of information without any editorial control whatsoever, yeah, and I get flood. their arguments why they don't want to be, but there is an irresponsibility with letting any piece of shit roll over so this So this thing. is an impractical trade, but yeah. do you think the world, w or let's say the country, was a better place when there was one source of truth, which was maybe Walter Cronkite, no. even if he was no. wrong. No, I have, I have always no. welcomed the internet. That was one yeah. of the things I liked. You know, I had a big argument with a bunch of people. We need gatekeepers. I'm like, well, you know, because of, they're gonna protect everyone. I'm like, well, as far as I can tell, all the gatekeepers are straight white men on the Upper East Side of New York, you know, running the networks or the New York Times right. or something like that. And so I don't think, same thing with Hollywood. It's much better when it's more diverse. There's more voices, there's yeah. more, um, you know, there's a scene with me, with Netflix. We, I had Reed uh, Hastings. Uh, I had Jason Kylar from he was starting Hulu, and Chad Hurley who had just started YouTube. And they put us in a basement at Sundance, yeah. and we kept telling Hollywood people, "We're like, this is coming. This yeah. is coming, and it's good for more diverse voices because you're going to be seen yeah. all over the thing." And so I've always believed in the diversity of the press. It's just that if it's un if there's no ability to pull the lies and the malevolent players out, it really, it's, it's, Steve, I, I am the one person who pays attention to Steve Bannon. He talks about flooding the zone. Flooding yeah. the zone is, with bad information, uh, drowns out the good information. It's just, it's just a classic propaganda move. Yeah. So, so that's why I'm, I, it's not diverse anymore. It's just, it's malignant. And, right. Um, and that was the big interview I had with Mark many years. I mean, everyone focuses on the sweat interview, which I felt bad for him, I honestly did. Um, but that interview about anti-Semitism was troubling for me, for, yeah. for, for him to, to not recognize, which he later did, but it, that amount of anti-Semitism going over the transom with no stopping it, they're going to do it. Anti-Semitism anti has existed since the beginning of time. Yeah. It is going to be Supersized in a way that is impossible to control. It doesn't need a new spreading tool. It doesn't need a new yeah. spreading tool, and lots of, and not, not just that. One of the things that was really interesting is I often go on Facebook, and a couple of years ago, when you know there was the the, um, the George Floyd protests, there was a friend of mine pointed me to this city, this town in Indiana, this sort of shithole town in Indiana, and they were convinced Antifa was coming for them, <laughs> and they were like, Antifa's coming. We need to. They're coming in buses. They were very specific, which I thought was fascinating. Yeah. And they're like, they're coming in these buses. They're going to come and break our town and smash our windows and do Antifa things. And it was crazy. And they, they, they we got to get our guns. We got to put, um, we got to cover our windows. We got to do this. This whole town was organizing. Yeah. And I got on there and I was like, hand, hand up. No one wants to come to your shitty little town. <laughs> one, two. There's no such thing as Antifa, really. Like, yeah. and they're not interested. They're going to go to the good cities, right? To really, if they want some news, they're going to the ones where they can really cause damage, yeah. if they existed in the way you say. Um, and they're not coming. And 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 we went back and forth. They got so mad at me. It was great. Um, and they um, and and they and when it didn't happen. They said it didn't happen because they were prepared. They switched oh, the that's line. Why didn't, that's why like my mom, it yeah. was amazing. Well, they didn't come because we had the guns and the things. I'm like, they didn't come because they don't exist. Like, <laughs> but you sit there and it's just, what do you say? Yeah, well, on a much lighter note, I mm -hmm. did learn something else in the book about you that I did not know. Was this a, your impact from Calvin and Hobbes? Yes. And I thought yeah. that you were like at a very kind of class of your own in terms of this, but there's a whole documentary about Calvin and Hobbes worship. I don't know. Do you know this? I, I don't worship them, but <laughs> <laughs> but dear Mr. Watterson, there's a doc about it. Oh but well, you could be. Was it on Netflix? No, it it's not. I, I don't watch it. It was on Prime. Prime. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you haven't heard of it. Did you? <laughs> Well done. 
that. <laughs> I'm so. I'm sure Jeff Bezos is somewhere crying on his yacht. <laughs> yes, I'm very hot. upset about this. I love his. Do you love his midlife crisis like <laughs> I do? Makes me very. I'm. I'm about to turn sixty, so it makes me very nervous. You have a lovely. Yeah. Don't, don't. You have a lovely wife. So tell, can Sorry. You, can What's you your question with, about Calvin Hobbes? Can you share Calvin with Hobbes? folks about Calvin yes. Hobbes? How it influenced your. So thinking. that's where I got to understand yeah. what was happening, which is the, the the heart of the book is this: everything that will be can be digitized will be digitized, and I recognize that I think a lot earlier than yeah. other people, and it was because I was on a fellowship, I downloaded Calvin and Hobbes into my, it must have been a compact computer, I don't, maybe a Dell of some <laughs> sort, but it was, uh, I was amazed that I could download the book, like that yeah. was something special, and I really, it was like one of those moments where you were like, oh, whoa, yeah. whoa, and I remember looking at everything around me, I was thinking the news, and then I saw Craigslist, it sort of was, a lot of those moments were, right. Netflix too, not the, when you guys started yeah. digit, putting things digital, I was like, oh, this is what people are going to do once the pieces come into place. And so I downloaded this Calvin and Hobbes book, and it was so clear to me that everything would go on this worldwide network. It, it was, was like a light bulb moment. It was a yeah. light bulb yeah. moment. And I kept saying it to people, and, and, it's, and I was also obsessed with cell phones. Yeah. Um, even the big ones. I had the big one. I had the Gordon Gecko one. Um, I had all the <laughs> cell phones, and I kept saying to people, you know, you're not going to be in the office. Like, and I, I was also remote 10 to years before everybody else. You're, you're I, I worked, OG work from home? I was. Yeah. Uh -huh. the, Mostly because I was such an unpleasant person. <laughs> <laughs> no one was trying to force you like back the to the office. office. I didn't like the office. It was a lot of talking. Yeah. <laughs> like, I got, I'm busy. That, that for me, it was interesting in those early days, meeting Reed in 1999. He described Netflix exactly like it is right now in mm -hmm. 1999. Yeah. And the internet was so slow and so expensive so for slow. video. Yeah. And I remember him telling me, and I had this, that where you saw it and said, oh my God, it's going to be everything. I thought, he might be crazy. Ah, really? uh, I wasn't sure if he really, if that's really going to happen. Right. But he, w and we went, but he was very matter of fact about it. Like, yeah. And I said, well, you know, I just downloaded a South Park video. It took seven days. I don't right. think this is yeah. really going to happen. Right. And he said, no, 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 the internet's going to get twice as fast that's and right. price every 18 months. It's called Moore's Law. Look it up. And yeah, this look is, it up. This was, yeah. And this was reason. So this what convinced like, you? Like, you believed it. I, um, I, I went home and digested at the meeting. And I, cause I said, you know, I don't know that I've ever met anyone who really radically changed the world before. Mm -hmm. I bet they're a lot like this. Yeah. Very sure of themselves, very yeah. clear he's about He's definitely yeah. sure of himself. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah. And, and so I said, I don't know if he's right, but if he's wrong, I was gonna t I'm going to learn a ton. Yeah. I'm just going to learn a ton. Yeah. And but it just seems so clear once you saw the World Wide Web. Anyone yeah. who saw it, anyone who saw Craigslist, it was so much better. Uh, and it, it's, it, I think most people were in denial that it was better, uh -huh. right? But I think, you know, at the Wall, Wall Street Journal, I was urging them as a young person to really use uh, digital, and they want to do another Saturday print journal. And I, yeah. and I was like, you really, this is coming. And we want to get the kids, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, like uh -huh. get going, because this is over. And one of the things I think press did that they didn't do well was they didn't, get the tech expertise they needed to transform themselves. Hollywood's right. the same way. Listen, that 300-mile that yeah. thing, the difference between the tech people, so many, I would come down here all the it time. It was so pronounced back there then, There were yeah. only two people, uh, not, I'm leaving Netflix out of it and you, but because you were part of a tech company, I think. Uh, you had sort of the mix of the two. Well, we were, I mean, because we were mail, like mailing disk was yeah. the cheapest way to move bits around. Right, so exactly. So it was a tech company, but I'm very... They liked yeah. you for that. You were selling yeah. their yeah, content, we were very low, right? Low, low tech tech company at the right. beginning. Yeah. But, but the, oh, there were only two people in the entire, I visited every one of these people. I was a covered Napster, everything yeah. else, was Bob mm -hmm. Iger and Barry Diller were the only people who absolutely understood what was going to happen to so me. When we were or had vague ideas of it. Back in, back in, in, in 2000, mm -hmm. the on, I'd say the only people who were, the only studio person who would ever come to Los Gatos, to, I, I never moved up there. I always worked mm -hmm. here from out of my house at the beginning, mm -hmm. then a little tiny office, and then now mm -hmm. where we're at now. But um, at the beginning, the only Hollywood person that ever came to Los Gatos was Peter Chernin. Oh, Peter Chernin too. Yeah. You're absolutely right. Yeah. Yes, yeah. He was definitely. I think it was a real like wanting not to believe it was going to happen. The music people yeah. were first. That was where it first hit. And I remember talking to Hollywood people, and I was like, "This is coming. For, are you kidding? This is perfect." Yeah. And, and I think for us, it's we always we knew it was coming. Like when we well, got in, we said the DVDs are going to be dead soon. What were they so, calling you? What was Jeff? I just talked to him the other day, uh, Jeff Bukas. Um, oh, the the Albanian army. The Albanian army. Yeah. When he called you that, and which I by the way, net, nothing motivates employees more than I mean, something like that. Yes. Yeah, so he, he called. Him, us, you know, we're really worried yeah. about the Albanian army, yeah. and. Uh, 
I remember when he said it, I called him. I said, oh, man, the Albanians are really good at war. Like, <laughs> better watch the friggin' we, we, Albanians. Our next company meeting, we had berets and uh, oh, dog you? tags. And, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and he said that. And just yeah. recently, he goes, well, I didn't quite mean it that way. I go, stop it. Yeah. Like, just to own your Albanian idiocy. <laughs> and so, People forget that Jeff Bukas is funny. Like, he's very he, funny. Yeah, he's yeah. very funny. So I'm sure he thought it was really and, funny. And you know what? He, he sold it. that company off to AT&T at right the right time. So uh, kudos. Well done. <laughs> Slow clap he, for him. We'll give him the Albanian army. Yeah, right. Yeah. You know, he understood it, but I think they but had Bob, the, Bob said, you know, selling arms to third world countries. Right. Just uh, giving us their licensing content. He did so. know that, yeah. but then he did it, right? Then he did it, right? Yeah. So um, you have to, this, what's happening now has to be done, whether you like it or not. And econ economically speaking, it's really hard for, it's, yeah. it's very, it's, it's, sometimes, I think one of the things I said, which made some people here angry was, your enemy is not the studios. It's not who you think it is. Now, yeah. I get the salaries. I get everything else. But your enemies are these tech companies. They just literally are going to eat everything in their path. And they have the means and the money to do yeah. so. And so and this was years ago I was saying this. I'm like, and I think media really missed it. I mean, newspapers was that they thought these people were their friends. And they, were, they are not your friends. They, are, they want is, to is, eat you. Alive. Is They're the, the book board. a wake-up call for this? I mean, honestly. I'm, yes, in yeah. this new AGI stuff. Yeah. Do you, who do you think dominates AGI? AGI is going to be devastating for Hollywood. It's going to be devastating yeah. for media. It is. It is. They are now. Before, you know, there's this thing in the book where Larry Page is. We're in New York. He has to stay in my mom's apartment because of a, a blackout. You know, and he's yeah. going. He was going around to publishers uh, to try to get them to. He was. He was um, starting to put their books on his service without permission. <clears throat> And I was always like, IP, right. you might want to look it up. You can't take people's the things. The out-of-print books first. I and I kept too, calling yeah. him like a shoplifter. It didn't work. It, he didn't care. Um, and he, he also, it wasn't even like malevolently not care. He's like, of course I can do it. Like, he had no sense of IP. Yeah. And it was crazy. And, and he was like, he went to these meetings with these publishers. And he said, they're not cooperating. And I said, that's because they know you're here to kill them. Like, you're here to kill them. But a lot of people didn't recognize that this is what, and they thought yeah. they were there for tools. They thought we're going to help you, we're going to distribute you. They had, they were, they want to eat everything. And with AGI, they used to just point to it and control it by distribution. Now they're going to scrape everything they can, yeah. and then you're going to have to go get it back. Yeah. That's the real issue. Anyone with IP should be suing those companies every single day until you get what you want. That part of it, I'm, I'm more with you too on the, the notion of the human creativity is gonna mm -hmm. be very, not likely to be replaced in this not model. Not likely. But the tool, like who's like you said, but there's gonna be that piece that has to be settled, the ingestion of things and who pays for that and how does they it They should pay, pay you, it's fine yeah. if they pay you. Yeah. It's just that, yeah. here's the thing. I, my hope is that the, these things are, you know, digital, digitally fingerprinted so that you're able That's to That's correct, but YouTube, stuff. it worked out for YouTube. They ended up, you yeah. know, initially they put that stuff up, didn't do yeah. anything about it, and then they worked something out. Now, yeah. same thing with music in a lot of ways. So yeah. what are you going to do? Although, look, Universal, as someone told me last night, um, Universal pulled uh, their music off of, uh, of TikTok. TikTok yeah. um, there are tons of fake Taylor Swift songs on there now made by AI, like it's on, for, on, on TikTok. TikTok. Yeah. So what do they need that for? They don't... They, they will do anything to suck and scrape your stuff and remake it and mush it up in some way. Right. They did that with me, which was amazing on this book tour. Um, they, there are fake Kara Swisher books all over Amazon, right? With very attractive, comely photos of me. <laughs> um, AI generated, they're terrible. I look really strange, Femi. And, um, and they're, they're, they were up there and I, my wife saw it. She's like, what is this? Who is this? Who is this in the search? Yeah. And I was like, what, what is this? What is this? And I realized what it was. It was AGI. Like, they just generate, there's probably like a button they push in, in, a, in the Philippines and it goes, you know, they <laughs> generate it essentially. And I wrote Andy Jassy, who's running Amazon, and I essentially wrote, what the fuck? Like, and he's like, oh no, it's you that it did it. Of to all me. the people, of I all know. the people. He said something like, of all the gin joints in the world, <laughs> had to AGI you. <laughs> And, and it, got to, it got some attention, but, you know, I was just with Savannah Guthrie, and they took uh, something of hers. She has this, God, this faith in God book. They made a workbook that is, and it happened to it's your wife, wife, too. too yeah. They created a workbook next to it 
that isn't hers, but they didn't just do that. They didn't just take that down, which is a lie. It's a, it's, and it's her brand next to it, right. or your wife's brand. It's, it's just knock off of the cover. And right, it's that. a knock off the cover. But then it said, buy Sam and Augustine's book and the workbook. Oh, they put them together? That's right. Uh -huh. And they were selling my book with my fake lady books, you know what I mean? <laughs> and I was like, fake lady doesn't get sold with yeah. Kershaw, but like, who gets the $16.99 for that? And, and then the customer gets a crappy book, That's, which are, and they think it's yeah. my fault. Like, right. honestly, the whole thing is, but yeah. they still make the money, and they should have anticipated yeah. this 100%. Yeah, and I do think it's one of those things, like, uh, you know, you're obviously not a technophobe, so mm -hmm. you're gonna want, you want people to advance the technology, but Absolutely. responsibly, which I think is a great. Right, so just sue it, yeah. them until they give you the money. Until That's all, yeah. because yeah. they haven't paid for safety. They don't pay, like, if you don't think they're like, I mean, Mark Benioff gave me an interview where he called them cigarette companies. And I think he's right. Let's just, you want to smoke a cigarette, that's fine, but pay for the cost that it costs the rest of society. If they're like opiate companies, just pay the cost of safety. If you right. were part of, um, if you were part of, and uh, uh, you should be able to be sued, that's all. That's yeah. all I say. You get sued, you can get yeah, sued, right? Happens. Yeah. All the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can. Quite a bit. <laughs> but, you, but at the other end of this thing, there is a, there is a, a very powerful tool set that can be a great aid to create. you're not protected by Section 230, really, right? No, no. You're not. Yeah. So you have liability. You make decisions as a yeah. CEO based on that. Yeah, and we cure, we, everything we do is curated, and we, we, it's not like we, we can hide right. behind that piece I'm of I'm saying, it, so. wouldn't you like to be able to yeah, have sure. immunity? <laughs> sure. Yeah. Sure. Cool. Can, we only have a few minutes, okay. and before we go to the audience questions, that I do want to ask you though, uh, I loved your OKR list for uh, identifying a partner, your wife, your, yeah. and how you vetted your wife, I guess, through the list. Yes, I did. And and, it's uh, uh, objective key, key results. Objective key results, yeah. But, uh, this, uh, your wife would have to be kind yeah. and generous, emotionally available, compromise ability, uh, intuitive, guide, kind to your kids. Um, these are like, do you, do, when you, as you go through life and you think about that list, which it seems like it served the list as well. It worked. Very well. Yes. A month. Yeah. Yeah. Are, are, is there a, if there were a similar list for a uh, tech CEO, mm -hmm. what oh. would that be? <laughs> there are a lot. I have a whole chapter about it. Um, I, I really like what Mark Cuban's done with himself. I really do. Yeah. I think he's doing, go watch him on Twitter. He's doing God's work arguing with them all about diversity, equity, inclusion. He's like trying to make you know considered arguments of his experience, and say this is why I like it, this is why I don't, this is what the good thing is, this is why it's a good thing. And he's making he's a business person, so he's telling you from a business point of view why he's doing it. And then Elon's response is always, "You're a moron, like <laughs> you fucking idiot." Like he doesn't want to have a discussion about it. He just wants to dunk on people. I think Mark Cuban is someone who's really he was a real tech bro boy. Was he a tech bro? But yeah. he has changed, and he's doing the stuff with cost plus drugs. Um, I like anyone that, um, that, that moves forward as a person, right? Brian right. Chesky's another good example. Um, he's made a lot of mistakes. I don't mind mistakes. Evan Spiegel is another person yeah. who really was a bro. Like, what a bro he was. I've had an argument with him right near here at lunch where he blamed me for his college emails, which I was like, listen, dude, that was you. That was all you writing terrible emails. So anyone who, who <laughs> progresses yeah. is good on my, or tries to do something and recognizes their responsibility. I, I, I would put like in uh, your next version, I, th I, th I would uh, nominate Reed Hastings Reed, to be yes, in, yes, to be in there. Because on top of all those I things, I think he has read in with these people. He's yeah. an adult. Talk about an adult. Yeah. He's an adult. And he, Absolutely. he orchestrated the succession of the company over about 10 he years. Did. He did. Uh, and while he was a young man, left. Yes, and, and he did. Yeah. He's got things to do. Yeah. Um, no, I wouldn't put your company in that. I don't find yeah. your company. It's hard to, to place Netflix. But yes, Reed is. I mean, Reed is an adult. He's in the. He is in the Tim. If I put him in a group, it would be Tim Cook, him. Um, you know, a lot of people like that. And you think very Such highly of Steve. But I mean, it, Steve. Yeah. I love Steve. I love yeah. Steve. I, I I know his faults. I know all his faults. Yeah, I was going to say I loved your uh, the prick to productivity um, ratio. Uh, ratio. Yeah. <laughs> and in my limited in interactions with him, he was pretty high on the prick scale. And he then was. Yeah. Before he got to the productivity scale part. Yeah, and, but the productivity but, was but the productivity the caught up. Yeah. You know what? It, but I bet he was a prick. Not about. You'd never see him dunk on Twitter. It was about the no, product, yeah, right? Always. It was always. always about the product. I, I got a call a Saturday morning when yeah. we were about to put uh, Netflix on the app on Apple TV. Mm -hmm. And someone called me and they said, I think you should get on this call. Um, Steve Jobs is on screaming at everybody mm -hmm. about how ugly how ugly our red our logo is. Mm -hmm. and, and and all the people didn't know what to say to him. Yes, right. Like, yeah, yeah. But it was uh, about the product. But he, was but he was on with a bunch of junior engineers talking about the color in our logo on how it, it looked like on his product. 
I'm not, I'm okay with that. It was yeah, about the too, product. Too, See, yeah. that's the thing, which is really interesting about him, is it was never, literally, he yeah. would never, you, you know, like you don't know what <clears throat> Reed or Tim Cook know, thinks about yeah. Ukraine. We yeah. have to endure this yeah. venture Why do capitalists. I need to know? Yeah, yeah. Like, let yeah. me tell you what to do in Southeast Asia. I'm like, shut the fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> well, before we jump Bill to Ackman, them, I don't you want to like slap <laughs> I got like a Let me tell you about DE. Let me tell you about hedge fund investing, <laughs> Bill. I know nothing about it, but We've, why don't I go on? I'm thinking a lot hours. about it tonight. Yeah. I want to tell you about it. I don't know. So, quick rapid fires. Um, someone you never get tired of talking to, interviewing on the interview set. Um, it would have been Steve Jobs. He was really interesting to talk to, oh, especially about products. Um, I really like, uh, in different areas, let me think. Um, I really like talking to Sachin Adela. He's really interesting. He's, yeah. uh, he's really a very complex human being, and I really, I think he's done a terrific job there. Um, I always like talking to Cuban. He's really fun, he's like, he's, and he's a fun guy to go out with. Um, uh, I like talking to him. He's always. He will answer a text in 10 seconds. Yeah, text in sec 10, 10 seconds. 10 seconds, yeah. But it's always interesting, and he doesn't always agree. Like, we had a big mm -hmm. debate about Elizabeth Warren and the wealth tax, which was, he was fun. I always like talking to Steve Case. He just, I just, he, he, I like Steve Case a lot. There's a lot of different people. Um, I'm going to try to name a woman. Um, I always, uh, because there's not, there just aren't there in tech as many as there should be. Um, but I always, I'm trying to think of a, person who was really, I mean, Mary Meeker was really interesting, and when she's not really doing that when she was an analyst. I really like talking yeah. to her. Um, but there's just Lisa Sue, but that's, you always end up talking about chips, and I'm completely out of my element with her. She's really cool. She runs AMD. Um, a, lot of, a lot of people, a lot of people. Any Usually not venture capitalists. No. <laughs> Any interview that you never got? Any interview that you wish you got and you never did? Um, I have a dream. I've said this, someone asked me this at dinner last night, uh, not just Taylor Swift. <laughs> Taylor Swift and Dolly Parton only talking about business mm. because they are they are killer entrepreneurs, yeah, both of them. Question. They're innovative. I want to talk about their entrepreneurship, and I do not want to talk about their boyfriends, whatever. I don't want to talk about sweet Tennessee home. I don't care about <laughs> hairdos and boobs. I don't care. I don't care. I don't care. I want to talk about how they are as entrepreneurs because they are yeah. really boy the both of them have done and dolly parton secretly has owns tons of ip she's doing all this yeah. ai stuff she is really interesting and there's it's like yeah. hidden in this cloud of fantastic and i'm fine with that yeah. but not now dolly i want to hear about your killer business she she came to netflix to do a pitch and she but it was a lot of prep and you go in and there was a, a little band of backup singers, and she put on a whole performance for, th for three she's, of us. Yeah. Right, she's a hard yeah. worker. Yeah, she's, yeah. I love she that. She didn't like, need to do that. She yes. did not need to do yeah. it. She just needed it. She could have, she could have yelled about the red she, button. We could have done it on great. Zoom. We could have done it on Zoom, for sure. Yeah, yeah, like she could have like, wouldn't that be fun if she came in and she was like a total bitch? <laughs> <laughs> not, nothing like I expected. She no. isn't, no, but no. she isn't. I just, I would love to just talk to them. That would be great. I, I, I'm working on getting Trump. I have an idea to interview him. I know, I know, I know. But I, it's hard to interview That'd a malignant narcissist. That'll be very watchable. Well, I want to do it at Mar-a-Lago live. Nah. Mm -hmm. well, live, too. Yes, he feels safe there. Nah. <laughs> I want to see that. <laughs> <laughs> and one last one. I know you loved your time in California. Yeah. Any chance you'd ever live in Los Angeles? I love Los Angeles. I hate people who insult it. I hate yeah. it. I hate people who insult California. I do. I do. Um, <laughs> I, I, I tell people, when I leave, if I leave California short the state, I love this place. This is a great state. Um, I, it's funny, did you see that story in the journal, the all coming back, all yeah. the ones? One of the things about venture capitalists, which I despise, is they like have to tell you why they do things all the time. Because, <laughs> and I keep going, aren't you like a lawyer? Shouldn't you shut up? And, um, and they love to talk about, they move somewhere and they tell you how much they hate San Francisco or Los Angeles, yeah. or whatever. And, and I'm like, move. stop talking about your girlfriend. We broke up. Let's move <laughs> along. Just move on. And they won't. And I think California is the center of, right now with AI, it certainly is, the center of innovation in this country. It's a, it's a, it's a giver state. If you look at w who gives and takes from yeah. the social or federal funds, you know, every time I'm somewhere where they're, they're starting to insult it, I go, I look at wherever state I'm in, I'm like, oh, you're a taker state. You know that, right? Yeah. You give nothing to this country. <laughs> you just take. <laughs> I said, S go thank California. Yeah. And then the other thing I do is there's a really funny thing. It's Judy Gold or one of them comics where she's like, uh, she's like, you know, someone insults California or whatever. And 
She's like, you get no more oranges. You get no more. <laughs> We're keeping all the oranges You get now. no more beaches, no surfing, no beach boys. You get none of it. And, and then when you start to do it, you're like, we've got problems. We're, There's no question. We're but, not sharing Kim Kardashian anymore. She's uh, all, yes, that's all right. ours. Does she still live here? Does yeah. She, yeah, she does. Yeah. Good. All right, Kim. I, love, okay. I, I did an interview with Kim. I, I took her seriously. Long, early. Early, and you had her on. I did. You, right? She was. Uh, yeah. She I called did. me back. <laughs> it's so funny. It's the last story. She calls me back. I wanted to put her on stage at, at one of the codes, and it yeah. was like Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, the stuff you uh, read. And she's like, "You want me on stage?" And I said, "Yeah. You've done astonishing things uh, with viral and social media. You're the top person here and here. This thing you did with the app is great." And she, she said, uh, "I'm not going to say what she said. She, said." she says, "People only call me a stupid blank." And you're the first person who took me seriously. And I said, I think you're a business person. Yeah. I said, I don't particularly like your content. But, and she's like, well, thanks. I was like, I don't. I don't like your yeah. content. <laughs> and, um, and, and, but we had a great conversation about entrepreneurship. That's, yeah. They're a very entrepreneurial She belonged family. on that stage. She belonged on that stage. She, yeah. Did. Yeah. she did. She did. All right. First question. Sarah wants to know, will Elon Musk ever grow up? Well, no. Absolutely not. No, he was, listen, the, the shift in his personality, Ted may have known him before, too, in the before times. Really, yeah. Um, he has changed, his personality has changed drastically. I don't say he's a perfect person. Look, there was big issues about racial and sexual issues at the factories, but that was pervasive in Silicon Valley. He wasn't the only one. That's not an excuse by any measure. Um, he has changed after, during COVID, something happened to him uh, that I is perplexing. Um, and I think if you read the journal stories about um, his use of ketamine and his self-medication, is some of the, he talks about his mental challenges. Um, I, I think he, some of the stuff he's done is remarkable. You can't take it away. The car, the EV industry is where it is today because of Tesla. Now he's going to get caught up with, as is inevitable. Um, and uh, and the space stuff is remarkable, remarkable. And he's not the one who did it, but he, he he's like in Steve Jobs wasn't the technical whiz of Apple, but he yeah. brought it to the forefront. So you have to give him that credit. Um, but he's 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 living in a world where everybody tells him he's gotten radicalized online in a way that's disturbing. He fact he's not fact based in a way that's disturbing. Um, he's got a mindset of this woke mind. I don't even know what he's talking. In any other day, he'd be a per crazy person on the street yelling at you, except he's rich. And so all these people around him enable him. And to watch it is really depressing. And he's zeroed out everybody, Sam Altman, Reed, ha Reed Hoffman, all these people who at yeah. least talk back to him, myself included, are gone. We're gone from his, and I wasn't, I was a minor part of that, but the people that really cared about him are disturbed, including members of his, his family. I, you know, I don't know. I think he's gone. He's, he's moved into the Howard Hughes version of this story. And it's going to end badly, I think, for him. Uh, maybe not. He's got enough money. He, I'm sh you know, people support, you, Hollywood has a million stories like that, right? <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Like they support them and yeah. then whatever happened to them. Um, Katie wants to know, your oldest kids are about to enter the workforce. Yes. If they wanted to work at a FANG company, which one would you tell them to apply to and which one would you tell them to avoid? Oh, wow. That's a good question. They wouldn't want to do... Well, actually, one of my sons is a science and computer. He's working... Uh, my 18-year-old's my at University of Michigan, and he is, uh, he's a science engineering. He's taking calculus, physics, whatever. He's quite a brilliant. Um, uh, he's much more interested in biotech, I'll tell you. He's really interested in biotech and also uh, uh, building uh, climate change tech. So I don't think he would go to any of them. I think he thinks they're the past uh, in a lot of ways. So he's the most technical person of the two of them. And so I wouldn't recommend him go going to any of them, actually, because they're not the future of what's really interesting in technology. I think climate change tech, biotech, um, the stuff around healthcare is really astonishing. The, I think we're going to solve cancer in this. I mean, not solve it. I think we're going to live it, live with cancer yeah. uh, for many of the cancers in this. Uh, helped by AI, helped by technology uh, in this uh, drug discovery, all kinds of things. So I think that's where he's headed. Um, for my other son, uh, he just was in a movie, Ted. <laughs> just, I know. Uh, I know it, it, should, weird. it won't surprise you that Kara's kids are smart and funny and charismatic. And, they are. Yes. Um, I think if uh, he wouldn't, he just wouldn't. He just doesn't. He he doesn't like social media. He doesn't like. He doesn't. He took took it all off his phone. He said it makes him feel bad. Um, See what so I mean? he was good. <laughs> he was like, I feel bad every time I use it. He uses 
He does, I'll tell you one quick story about him. He, he does like YouTube. He watches stuff on YouTube. He does watch my Netflix, sorry. Um, but, <laughs> uh, but he's going to be off soon, I swear to God. I just can't believe I said that. Um, but, uh, well, we got an eye on him. We yeah, got okay, it. good. Um, <laughs> I, did, I did kick my mother off. Um, <laughs> Uh, selective enforcement. Selective right? enforcement. Yeah. So um, I, I wouldn't recommend, uh, I, I, I don't, none of them. None of them. I wouldn't want them to work for anyone. TJ asks, it seems every few months there is a wave of panic about TikTok in Washington. Yes. Do you think the concern about TikTok is overblown, understated, or is it being given the appropriate level of concern? Uh, it is not overblown. Um, I wrote a column a couple years ago saying, I, TikTok, this was five years ago now, saying, or more, saying TikTok's the most exciting new product I've seen in a long time. It's entertainment. I think you think it's entertainment. I think yeah. you've talked about that. Um, and I'm using it on a burner phone because Chinese Communist Party. This is a surveillance device, it is surveillance or a propaganda device. And uh, it's already bad enough when it's for capitalist reasons, but this is a country that has really, everyone's talked about that balloon that yeah. was over our country. By the way, there's many more balloons than you think. but. Right. Um, I just talked to someone who's tracking all the, there's a lot of balloons, well, balloons flying over here. our country. It's crazy. We're so stupid. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there's no balloons, our balloons flying over China, but they're flying over us. Um, this is a society, this is a, I love, it's not the Chinese people, it's, the, it's this government. This is a surveillance economy. Um, this is, uh, I, and I very much like a lot of the people who work there, and I like the product. I think it's a great product. But if we can't have social media in their country operate without any uh, thing, they shouldn't be able to operate in this country. That's one. Two, um, I don't, um, I, I just think some of the people I've talked to who are really smart about this stuff, um, if someone who's leaving Congress, Mike Gallagher is quite smart about it. Um, John uh, Warner, Mark Warner, uh, Bennett, all these people who've seen a lot of this stuff are very clear what's happening here. We just, we cannot, we cannot, this is a real problem, and it's not because kids love it. If they separate it or somehow found a way to protect it, they just cannot assure us that the Chinese Communist Party isn't. And if we, you know, we can act all like, oh, they don't really want to beat us, but they really want to beat us. They really do. And we've got enough fascist problems in this country, authoritarian <laughs> problems, that we don't need to add on, you know. And they've come in and done so much propaganda, and why wouldn't they? That's what they do, that's why wouldn't they? Not just the Russians, the Chinese, the Iranians. Kerry, do you think, pre, way, right. way predating TikTok, do you think Steve Jobs understood the addictive nature of this? Of he this? did, he, he talked about it. it you know, he, no. t he did talk about it a yeah. lot. I think he, um, he did, he talked about it quite a yeah. bit. He thought the, the business plans of things like Facebook and others were by nature addictive and deleterious, and he yeah. said it quite, he hated the business plans, he hated the advertising right. nature of it, he hated the idea of virality. Right. Um, I, I'm not sure, there are elements you can do on this phone to make it less addictive. They haven't done nearly enough stuff yeah. to make it less addictive. These are by nature casino machines, and so yeah. I, I, I urge you to read Tristan Harris, um, but there's certain things they could have done put things files below and not let it happen. Like Uber is not something you go on and sit there and stare at it. It's right, just right. a utility, right. right? Same thing with Netflix, you kind of watch, you, you have your watching the next thing, but people do have some control of their entertainment. Yeah. They don't sit there endlessly. But a TikTok and things like that, you can't stop, it's addictive by nature. Yeah. And then for your work, you can't not use it if you're a work person. So right. yes, right. I would say we're not doing, I think we have to think really hard uh, I have agreed with exactly zero things that Donald Trump does, uh, in, uh, including his just existence, really. Um, and, um, he did, but yeah, he, did but he, one, he yeah. was correct on the, on the danger of it. Executionally, as always, as he does with everything, it was wrong and it, it wasted a huge opportunity to have a real bipartisan discussion about this. He, he wrecked what should have been a really important discussion in this country. Lisa asks, uh, you dedicate the book to Walt Mossberg. Tell yeah. us about him and your relationship and why it was so important. Yeah, I just saw him the other night. Walt Mossberg is the one who hired me into the Wall Street Journal. He's the first person I really melded with on the importance of the internet. He and I really pushed it at the journal. The journal was very behind in internet and tech coverage and Walt was the pioneer. He's the OG um, everything. He was yeah. a great reporter. He had a point of view. He taught us, to, he was an entrepreneur. 
Um, he was an incredible mentor, especially to women. Um, he just changed my life, it just completely. And with, with the gener kind of generosity and lack of any kind of uh, expecting anything in return, and he really, he was the greatest, I think, he really set the tone for tech journalism in that if I like it, I'll say so, but I'll do the reporting to tell you why I like it. If I don't like it, I'll say so. And yeah. I think most people in the industry felt that about Walt, uh, you know, including, uh, you know, Steve used to call him when he did a review he didn't like, and uh, he was very pro, he liked Apple products in general, because yeah. Apple products are good. And, you know, he would, um, he would call him up. I don't agree with this tiny sentence in this really largely glowing <laughs> review, of course. He'd scream at Walt, and Walt would say, oh, sorry, Steve, I'm gonna do it. This is what I thought. And eventually, Steve would be like, yeah, you're right. <laughs> you know, so just an astonishing person who is just one of these greats of journalism and is unsung in many ways. Andrew asks, many reporters at the time of the dot-com boom jumped over to work in the industry. Were you ever, were you ever tempted? I was not <laughs> tempted, but I was offered a job at AOL early. Ted Leonsis always loves to text me how much I'd be worth, quite a bit. <laughs> um, but not as much as the offer I had at Google, which yeah. was early, early. Before my, my ex-wife worked there, I actually urged her to work there. Um, uh, that was a big job. That would have been yeah. good. I would have been rich. I'm richer <laughs> than you, Ted. Um, I, I was offered a job at Facebook. Um, I was offered a job at Groupon. I'm glad I didn't take that one. <laughs> um, <laughs> I was offered a job at uh, almost all of them. Amazon, Amazon, very early. The is editorial that, director. Does that happen in other industries where the the the, the beat reporter? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The they become they work for politicians yeah, and stuff. Yeah, yeah, they yeah. do. Um, and I just was like, I don't want to talk to you. Like it was <laughs> it was my my unpleasant nature with being an employee. I was I always call myself a bad employee. Probably was to my detriment because I don't know a billion dollars might be a good thing to have right now. To be yeah. honest, <laughs> you may not have like coming no, to our new like, employee college. If we it was like yeah. it was like a billion dollars. <laughs> <laughs> I'm such an idiot. Oh. And then I married someone who I made go to Google, and then when we got divorced, I didn't take any Google stock. I'm such an idiot. <laughs> I just was like, oh, it's you made it, it's yours, okay. And then she bought a ridiculous house. Anyway. <laughs> She's great. She's terrific. She's amazing. She's amazing. She became asks, the CTO of America, too, by the way. Of America? Yeah. yeah. TJ asks, um, if, there an AI, if there was an AI council that was responsible for helping ensure the safest and most ethical rollout of AI possible, great question. what tech founders or tech personalities would you like to see or chair this council? You know, it's funny you're saying that because on Thursday, Sam Altman and I are going to talk in uh, yeah. San Francisco at City Arts and Lectures. Um, I have p pummeled them with ideas about board members of the, on, for OpenAI, you know, because they're naming yeah. 12 board members uh, to the, I think it's 12, something like that. It's a large- This might be the closest thing to what Yes, this is the now. closest because it's the most exciting. It's sort of, yeah. it c it's either going to be the Netscape, which means it's going to go bad, or it's going to be a really important, it's going to be the yeah. Google, yeah. right? essentially. Um, so I've recommended uh, Dr. Fei-Fei Li, uh, who is at Stanford, who's an astonishing, she was the very first, one of the first AI pioneers. She's just, she's got a real down the line, s smart thing about safety and also the dangers and the possibilities. So I like that. I think there were too many accelerationists and decelerationists on those boards and they were just, it was like our country. It was like nobody wanted to figure out how to make it work right and put in safety measures. I'd put her on the board in seconds. Um, I would put, um, there's a number of politicians I might put on the board or regulators. Um, I don't think I'd put too many tech people on it. I think their self-interest is too high. It's too much money at stake. It cuts um, across everything, every yeah, company. Yeah, I'd put a, definitely put a couple media people on it, on the board, that, you know, some, a number of media people, because it's- IP focused people. IP yeah. focused people. Yeah. Um, but if, if anyone, I would put, the, the, the direction I would go would be Dr. Fei-Fei Li, because I think she is, she was the first person who showed me AI, I, really she was, and, um, and I think she's just one of these great thinkers. She's just written a book, it's worth reading, she's tremendous, she's a tremendous person. All right, I have time for two more questions. Linda asks, um, uh, Regarding the gender pay gap in tech, Mark Benioff at Salesforce recognized this um, about 10 years ago and mm -hmm. tried to address it. What about the rest of the industry? You know, actually, no, numbers are getting better. They are indeed getting better. It's not, that's not exactly true anymore, but it's, it's not more of a pay gap, it's a people gap, that there's not enough people. Um, uh, it's just, many years ago, one of the 
best leads I've ever written on a piece, and I edited it myself, so I thought it was great, and I wrote it, um, <laughs> and I approved it, was a thing, I used to write pieces that it was just one piece, and it wasn't really a written piece, there were, there were three in a row, th three in a row. Uh, the first one was called The Men and No Women of Facebook, and I just put their pictures up. The Men and No Women. Right. Yeah, uh, there was just no one in the management. This is yeah. priest Cheryl Sandberg, even. Right. And she en ended up apparently representing eight women, I guess. Um, <laughs> but it was really amazing how the very few people they had. This is early, early Facebook. And then I wrote The Men and No Women of the Web 2.0 Boards. And it was a because boards you can get. Yeah. You can really find a diverse group of thinkers. And right. it, not same thing was all the same thing. And the one board that drove me crazy was Twitter, uh, which early on had, um, speaking of Peter Chernin, um, had 10 white men of the same age on the board. It was crazy. And this was a diverse service. This, right now, Twitter is essentially, you know, Ben Shapiro screaming at you, um, <laughs> eventually, versions of him screaming at you. But it was, it was a, it's a very diverse, it was a very diverse thing. And you could see by the numbers, and they had 10 white men. And so, um, so my lead of the story was um, on the board of Twitter, which has three Peters and a dick, uh, which <laughs> was so good. I could have, I should have, I should have left journalism. I was like, and I'm out. Uh, Mic drop on that I one. think it was, it's been, we covered, uh, anyway, that, I, in the head of it, Dick Costello called me and he's like, I said, first of all, if that's your name, that's your name. I don't know what to tell you. Um, uh, and he's like, very funny, very good penis joke. I go, thank you, thank you. And, and he was a comedian, right? He so was, yeah, he was yeah. a stand-up guy. He goes, but it's not fair. And he said something to me, and he's actually one of the better guys, goes, you know, but we have standards. Hmm. Always the word with women and people of color, <laughs> standards. And I was like, well, let me look at your stock price and your results and everything else, because it looks like you're a clown car, which Mark Zuckerberg <laughs> called it, a clown car that ran into a gold mine. But actually, there's no gold mine. There's no money here. You're losing money. Your stock is in the tank. You guys are fucking idiots. Was that the standard, fucking idiots? And, <laughs> and he, was like, he was like, well, when you say it like that. And I was like, well, when I say it like that. So there were no standards. And, and what's incredible is that, they, they, that, that, that it persists, it persi yeah. this idea so it's either straight white men are the best people on earth, or maybe they're wrong, like, you know, <laughs> like kind of thing. And so I think they, the, the line I use in the book is, is it, it, they think it's a meritocracy, and it's a meritocracy. They really yeah. do like hang out. And again, when we covered the Ellen Powell trial, which we did quite heavily, which yeah. was against Kleiner Perkins, um, it just was, every woman in tech had a story similar to Ellen's. This was, sex, yeah. uh, this was gender uh, discrimination. She lost the case because they had better lawyers and we covered that. Um, everyone had a story as a woman. All the men, and there's a number of bad men, but most men were not bad men. They were like, wow, I had no idea. That was the, that was the overall right. thing. And I was like, either the women aren't talking to them and telling them what's happening, or they're just blissfully unaware of the, of the, of the fact. And they make excuses about pipeline, they make excuses about this and that and this, whatever, but it really, there's no excuse for it. It doesn't exist. Other industries, science, even, even I, I know there's a problem here, but boy, is it, up there, it's kind of crazy. Um, yeah. You know, almost every industry is starting to move. Getting better. To your point, better. I think the, the number of people coming but in not in the funnel, tech, not in funnel. tech, yeah. not in tech, never in tech. So it's yeah. really, it's one of the things that's been another, it's a reason why, and I'll leave you on this, there's a reason why tech is unsafe for people, or the unsafe parts happen because the people who created it do not feel unsafe. And they're never unsafe, and so they don't understand it. And this is not some whiny liberal talking about it. They don't think about implications. They don't think about consequences. And they, as we're go, this, is, this is, book is two years late for my publisher, but it's actually on time. With AGI, we need to think very hard about the implications yeah of what's going to happen. And we have to set guardrails, and we have to stop listening to them tell us that if we set guardrails on them, innovation will die. It will not die. It will thrive if we set some guardrails. It's like kids, and this is a bunch of kids who've been given sugar for far too long, <laughs> and they have diabetes, and they're fucking nuts. And <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, that's it. Thank you. Thank I think you've you got one more. Ted, you got? One more. Okay. Just one last question. Debbie says, um, Wait, tell me... Who also insulted my signature? You need to leave. Someone, someone tweeted. Debbie me. asks, uh, tell me about your decision not to have an index in the book. Oh, yeah. And is there anyone uh, you portrayed in the book that you might um, 
have a challenging time speaking to now. I don't care. I don't care. <laughs> Um, I was joking that I thought Elon would sue me, but I've hired Roberta Kaplan as my lawyer, so. <laughs> <laughs> she actually was on the show and she said, any time, Kara, I love it. <laughs> you know, so that's good. Um, she, did, she does pretty well, it seems. $83 million for us, it was great. <laughs> I could use that money, Ted, but here's two things I did in the index. So the back of the book, it says praise for Kara Swisher. It's not really praise. Yeah. It's not praise and it's fake blurbs, but they're not fake blurbs, they're unpleasant things tech men have said about me. And so when they did it, they think they're so cute to go on Twitter and dunk on me. And I said, I will use it as a marketing opportunity. Um, and so I did. And so at one time, Elon said, well, you are right. And this says, you're an asshole, Elon Musk. Um, and here, this guy, who I don't like very much, said, not a single more vitriolic voice in the tech ecosystem. And so I put it there. I was like, excellent marketing for Kara Switcher. <laughs> and, then, and then they kept doing it. And so I put all these unpleasant things about me as praise for Kara Swisher. <laughs> and the two favorites, the two favorites are Elon's, which are recently, they're recently, they were nice before, but then they changed. <laughs> Kara has become so shrill at this point that only dogs can hear her. <laughs> <laughs> He's so witty, what a witty guy. God, do you think he'd be that, you'd, you'd actually pay people to be smarter if you were that rich. <laughs> and the other one, I have rarely seen evil in as pure form as Yoel Roth, which, who he called a pedophile and got death threats for. He was not a pedophile. He left, he just quit Elon. So this guy named Yoel Roth, to give you context. I've rarely seen evil in such a pure form as Yoel Roth, and Kara Swisher's heart is filled with seething hate. I regard their dislike of me as a compliment. <laughs> and I wrote, Elon Musk, who could use a compliment these days, September 2023. <laughs> um, so so the, the index, so one of the things I did was deconstruct books, things I don't like, I took out. So the index um, was, um, there was two notes. Uh, th th people have a lot of notes in books, and I decided, this is a memoir, why do I need this? And I go, there will be no notes, notes, citations, or bibliography in the books. Why? Because I'm not Bob Woodward, because I'm not Bob Woodward, okay? <laughs> and that's it. Um, and then I talk about what I did. And then in the index itself, I think a lot of people go to the back and look for their, um, See look they're for there. Th they're there. <laughs> and I was like, fuck you, read my book. If you don't read it, I don't care. <laughs> and so, so I wrote, it's very short, I go, there's no index, people, so you have to read the whole book all the way through to see if you're in it. I'll be honest, most of you are not. <laughs> still, <laughs> I've forgotten about so many people, it's crazy. Um, still, read it all, even though it's hundreds of pages. Think of it like doom-scrolling Twitter, X, X, Q, whatever, at Elon, you ceaseless dra drama diva. In any case, I believe you can all still pay mine for more than 15 seconds, especially since you'll be alternately amused, horrified, repulsed, and ultimately in violent agreement with me, you know, you know I'm right, so enjoy the ride. <laughs> Can I uh, just say for everybody, Yeah. this is, um, now you see why Kara is the most feared see, and loved person. you come back? Why do you come back? Huh? Why do you come back? Why do I come back? Why do you come back and talk to me? Uh, it's, it is, it's interesting, uh, it, well, A, because you're hysterical, okay. and B, you're very, very smart, uh -huh. and you're right a lot. Uh -huh. So, um, but I would say and that- And you're not a toddler. Yeah, <laughs> maybe, okay, I'll take, take that. I'll take that. I will tell you from first-hand experience, being interviewed by you mm -hmm. is a very nerve-wracking experience. <laughs> uh, I've had it a few times, and interviewing you has been a I'm blast. super excited Fantastic. for our next interview. Though. I'm ready to, yeah. me too, <laughs> me too. So he committed to it, he committed to it. Thanks.